Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So today we're going to continue our adventures through sorting algorithms. Why is Radix sort so fast? Part 2, Radix sort itself. Let's have a bit of a look. The first sort that we're going to talk about here is called counting sort. And counting sort is fast with a capital F-A-S-T. This absolutely flies. Okay, so let's imagine that we've got 32 little elements just here in this uh, unsorted list of, uh, of little elements. There's a whole bunch of repeats. There's a four just there. There's another one there. There's a few nines. Yeah, so it's the digits from zero to nine and they kind of repeat. So we could, if we wanted to, use a comparison sort if we wanted to. In the worst possible case, we'd be looking at something like the logarithm base two of 32 factorial, which I think comes out to be about 118 comparisons uh, in the worst case. But looking at that list, surely comparison sorts are an overkill. The data looks pretty simple, right? I mean, it's just the digits from zero to nine. So let's do something else. Let's just make 10 little counters from zero all the way to nine and we'll start them all at zero. Then what we might do, instead of sort of sorting or comparing any elements at all, what we might do is just count the number of occurrences of each digit. For the little zero count down here, there's actually three occurrences of the digit zero. So we could just put a three in that little counter there for the zero. There's actually only one element which has the number one. So the count in the one box would be one. We could continue in this way, counting up how many occurrences there are of the digit two, how many occurrences there are of the digit three, uh, all the way up to how many occurrences there are of the digit nine. And what we've got just here is uh, a little array that we've built but we didn't compare anything. We just counted how many occurrences of each digit there was. But as you can imagine, from these little counts just here, we could fairly easily rebuild the sorted array. The number of zero elements in the original array was three. So when we come to rebuild the array, we could just write three zeros at the start. And then there was one, one digit in the original array. So we could write one, one just there. Uh, there was also one two digit in the original array. What we can do here is rebuild our array uh, based on the counts all the way from three little zeros at the start all the way up to the six nines that were in the original array. We've produced the sorted array. In other words, we've sorted the original list of numbers, but we didn't use any comparisons at all. I mean, we never asked is element two greater than or less than element 50 or whatever. The algorithm that we just used there is actually called counting sort. Pretty simple stuff, really. When we actually perform a counting sort in code, uh, we usually only traverse the list twice. So we run through the list once, uh, incrementing each digit as we find them. And then the second time that we run through the list, we're actually writing the sorted list back in place, which means that counting sort actually has a running time which is linear to the input size. Yeah, it's big O N. Okay, so counting sort is really, really fast. I mean, it's, it's very, very fast. If you can use a counting sort, then do uh, pretty much. But there's a bit of a problem with counting sort, something that's uh, probably fairly obvious. One of the parameters in counting sort is the number of different types of element that you've got. In our little array before, we had the digits from zero to nine. And it's easy enough to maintain 10 little counts uh, using a modern computer. Uh, we could easily maintain, say, a hundred or a thousand different counts if we wanted. But the problem is if we start to get to larger elements, say a 32-bit unsigned integers, we suddenly need massive, massive amounts of RAM just to store the counts. So that's going to be something like four billion different counters. And then if you think about 64-bit integers, I mean, trying to sort 64-bit integer array, that's more RAM than there is in the whole world. Okay, so our objective is fairly clear. We can use something like counting sort and we can overcome the n log n barrier that uh, limits comparison sorts. But there's a bit of a downside in that we can't maintain 658 trillion different counters. So what we're going to do is figure out a bit of a compromise. We want to swap some of the memory that we would need to store our counters. We want to swap that for speed. So we want an algorithm that runs uh, very fast, maybe not as fast as counting sort, but it doesn't use as much RAM for counters. And that, my friends, is Radix sort. Okay, so we're going to turn over now and have a bit of a look at Radix sort itself. Now, the first version that we're going to look at is Radix sort with bucket sort. 
And then after that, we'll have a look at uh, something closer to how it's usually implemented in a computer, and that's uh, radix sort with counting sort. But the bucket sort version, I think, is, is kind of easy to understand, so we'll have a look at that first. Below, I've got my unsorted list, and we've got a bunch of buckets. Starting from the left-hand side of our unsorted list, we're going to examine the elements one at a time, but we're only going to look at the lowest digit or the digit in the ones column. If we look at this first number just here on the left, 717, you see that in the ones column, the digit is seven. So what we would do is we would take that element just there and we would put it into the seven bucket over here, just like this. All right, then we move to the next number, 026, which is 26. That has a digit, a lowest digit of six. So we would put uh, 26 in the little six bucket just here. Keep going from left to right, just examining each number. 785 will go into the five bucket, 636 into the six bucket. Okay, so we continue in this way until we've placed all of the numbers into the buckets corresponding to their lowest digits. Good stuff, what a bunch of buckets we've got. At this point, we've run through the entire list once and uh, it hasn't been very complicated, but the next step is to collect up all of our items from the buckets and rebuild our array. Yeah, so we just take the elements out of the zero bucket. Then we take the elements of the one bucket. Well, there's no elements in the one bucket. The two bucket has 572 in it and 772. You notice that we take them out in the reverse order. We take the elements from the three bucket, 023, then the four bucket, 304. Anyway, we just put all of the elements from our buckets back into our array and hey presto, we haven't got anything sorted at all. <laughs> our array will look something like this. So 350, 660, 572, 772, 023. I mean, it's not sorted, but we've only done one iteration. So let's do another one, shall we? For the second round, we do exactly the same thing, except this time what we're going to be doing is looking at the second digit of each number. So the tens column, in other words. So we'll start on the left. The second digit of 350 is a five. So we would just put the 350 into the five bucket. Then 660, the second digit there is a six. So we'd put that into the six bucket. 572 will go into the seven bucket. We'll end up with the buckets corresponding to this just here. So now that we've got all of our elements in our buckets, we want to rebuild our array. So we collect our items back up once again from the zero. 304, then we put in the one element, 717. Then we put in the elements in the two bucket, starting from the lowest first, 023, and then 026. Collect all of our elements back up again and build our array. This is what we've got after two iterations, 304, 717, 023, 026, etc., etc., all the way up to 699 and our array is not sorted. Let's do a third iteration and see what happens, shall we? The fingers crossed that something marvelous happens. <laughs> this time, we're gonna go through our list once again. We're gonna look at the hundreds column or the third digit of each number. If we have a look at the third digits of each number, we got 304 or 304. The third digit is a three, so that would go into the three bucket. The next number 717, the third digit there is a seven, so that would go into the seven bucket, etc., etc. We just put all of our little numbers back into the buckets corresponding to the highest digit. And we'll get something like this. Let us collect our elements back out of the buckets and rebuild our array exactly as before. And if we have a bit of a look at this array just here, what you'll notice, it's sorted. <laughs> okay, so we went through three iterations of something called a bucket sort. We sorted by one digit each iteration, just throwing our elements into the appropriate buckets and uh, collecting them back out again to rebuild our array. Our list ended up sorted. Okay, so there is a bit of a problem. So, I mean, it's all fine and good to say, and then you collect your items out of the buckets and you put them back in your array. But when we're programming an algorithm, we have to be specific. Uh, you just can't talk about buckets. How do you collect it out of your buckets? There's no buckets in RAM. <laughs> How exactly do we do this uh, efficiently? It might be tempting to uh, try and implement your buckets as something like a linked list to build a queue-like structure. And, and that would work, that would work. But the, the problem with uh, something like linked lists in this particular situation is that uh, linked lists actually require a lot of uh, memory allocation and deallocation. When you add and remove items, you've often got to allocate and deallocate memory, and that's going to be really slow. The other thing about linked lists is that every element in the list actually requires the, the data as well as a pointer to the next element. 
So you would also find that you might be taking up a lot of uh, extra RAM. Uh, thankfully, thankfully, there's a better way to do this. Uh, so let's have a bit of a look at how to implement a radix sort using an absolutely marvelous, marvelous trick. Um, this is a way to use uh, a radix sort using counting sort rather than bucket sort. Okay, so we create two arrays. One is called the output and it's the same size as the input array. And the other is an array for counts or storing the counts. And here what we're going to do is use a radix of 10. We will see when we look at the real code that actually you don't usually use a radix of 10 because, well, why would you? But anyway, <laughs> we've got the input list just here. Same elements as before, I think. Well, you wrote it, mate. Let's... <laughs> um, okay, so the input array is the data that we're sorting and the counts are all initialized to zero. And I've also illustrated indices above the elements. That will just make things a little bit easier to explain when we come to this step a bit later on. This is how it works. We take elements from our input from left to right. This is the first iteration of our radix sort. So we're gonna be looking at the lowest digits or the ones column digits. Looking at this 277 just here, the lowest digit is a seven. So we would increment the seven count by one, just like that. Then once we've done that, we move to the right. The next number here to the right, 806. The lowest digit just there is a six. So we would increment the six counter by one. We just keep moving through the array. So 681, we'd increment the one counter. 462, we'd increment the two counter until we've gone all the way through our array, incrementing the counts of the digits as we found them. At the moment, what we've got down here in our counts, once we've finished running through the entire array, we had zero elements ending with a zero digit, two elements ended with a one, one element ended with a two, etc., etc., all the way up to one element ended with a nine. And what we've got just there is counts of the number of times each digit occurred in our original list. But the next step is a really, really interesting one. It actually has a name. So what we're about to do now is compute what's called the prefix sum. Uh, if you want to look that up on uh, Wikipedia or whatever, I might leave a link somewhere for you to good luck. This is how it works. Uh, we work from left to right, just summing the elements up in the counts. Uh, we start, start on the left just here. The leftmost element of the uh, count array is zero. So that just stays a zero. Uh, but for the next element, we actually add the current value, which is two, to whatever the sum is so far. So the sum so far should be in the box to the left at zero at the moment. Uh, then we move to the next value. This is the one just here in the two box. And what you want to do is sum that one with the total so far. So the total so far was actually two from the previous box. So one plus two becomes three. And that would be your result in the two box just here, a three. But then once again, you move across to the right and the next box has a two in it. And you just sum that two with the previous sum so far. So two plus three gives you five and five is what you write in that box. So you just continue summing all of the elements. So the next one would be um, one plus five gives you six. So you'd write a six in the four box. Then we'd have uh, two plus six gives you eight. So you'd write an eight in the five box. You just continue from uh, left to right. Yeah, just summing all of the elements together. So when you're done, your counts should look something like this. This uh, array that we've got just here, we've just converted our counts into the prefix sum. Uh, but now what we're going to do is uh, use this prefix sum to build our output array. So you remember back in the uh, radix sort where we used bucket sort, um, we actually had to rebuild our array at each iteration and we could take the, take the elements out of the bucket and put them back in our array. Uh, well, we can't do that with a counting sort. I mean, we don't have any buckets, but we can use the prefix sum to uh, rebuild our array. And this is how we do it. Watch this, this is gold. Uh, okay, so if you have a bit of a look at the prefix sum, it actually means something really interesting. So the prefix sum actually specifies the indices uh, to where these digits actually should go. Okay, so, so this does get a little bit awkward because the prefix sum is actually counting in a one based counting system, whereas the array indices are actually zero based. Uh, so we do have to do a little subtraction here. But if you think about what we've got just here, that 16 above that nine digit just there, that means that the number from our original list that ended in a nine actually goes in position 15 
one less than the 16. Yeah, one less just because the prefix sum actually counts on uh, base one instead of base zero. Okay, so this is how we rebuild our array from the prefix sum. We actually start from the right hand side of our input array and we look at the first number. So the number ends in a one and then what we're gonna do is come down here and look at the one box in our counts. So the one box has the number two in it. Subtract one from that to give us one. And that is the index to where 721 should go in the output array. Then we move to the left in our input array. The next number after 721 is 779. 779 ends in a nine. So we have a look at our prefix sum at the box number nine, and we see that it's got 16 in it at the moment. So we've got to subtract one from that to get 15. And then 15 is the box in the output array where we put the 779. Then we move to the left in our input array. We look at the next number. You see, so we're just moving from uh, right to left through our input array. Uh, the next number is 307, which ends in a seven. If we have a look at the prefix sum down here, we see there's a 13 in box number seven. So we subtract one from that to get 12 and we place 307 in index number 12 of our output array. So if you continue doing this, what you'll end up with is something like this. So what we've managed to do just here is uh, one iteration of the radix sort, except we haven't had to allocate and deallocate lots of little buckets or anything. Um, we just used a simple count, then we computed the prefix sum, and then we worked backwards through the input. Okay, so that's one iteration through the radix sort using counting sort. So we've got to clear our counts back to zero, ready for the next round. And the next thing that we've got to do is actually copy the data from the output array to the input array. Yeah, so we don't really care what the original list was anymore. We've sorted by that first digit. So you want to copy the output to the input. Now there is a good time saving trick you can do here if you're using a language with pointers. You can actually just swap pointers of the output and input array. Do be careful though, if your radix sort does an even number of iterations, then swapping pointers will be fine. But you do have to be careful if there's an odd number of iterations in your radix sort, then you might actually end up with your input and output being swapped by the time you return your sorted list. But whether you swap pointers or you actually copy, we end up with something like this. We're ready now for the second round or, or the uh, radix sort on the tens digit. Pretty much the same as before. We're just gonna run through our input list from left to right. And this time we're examining the tens column. So the first number here, 681 has a tens column of eight. So we'll just increment the eight just there. Then the 721, we'd increment the two. 462, we'd increment the six, etc., etc. You should find something like the counts just here. So three, one, one, zero, 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 four, two, four, one. Just the same as before, we've got to compute the prefix sum so that we've got indices in the output array rather than just counts. So the zero box just here has a three. That's gonna stay as a three when we compute our prefix sum. The one box just here has a one. So we wanna sum that with the three. It's gonna give us four in the one box. Then the next box has a one in it. So that's gonna be five until we've computed our entire prefix sum. So once again, to build our output array, we're gonna move from the right-hand side of the input to the left-hand side. Uh, okay, so 779, the second digit just there is a seven. So we come down here and look at our prefix sum in the box number seven. It has an 11 in it. So we subtract one from that, and then we store 779 in box number 10 of our output. The next number in our list as we move to the left is 988. Second digit there is an eight. So we'd subtract one from the 15 in this little box just here. That tells us that this uh, number belongs at index number 14 in the output array. Until we've moved all the way from the right hand side to the left hand side of our input array and we have built our output array for the second iteration of the radix sort. Okay, so once again, we're just about ready for the third and final iteration. So we zero all of our counts. There's no counts anymore. We've also got to copy the data from the output over to the input array. We are ready for the final uh, iteration of our radix sort the hundreds column this time. Alrighty, so 905, the hundreds column is a nine. So we'd increment the nine count. Then we've got 806 and we'd increment the eight count. Then 307, we'll increment the three count. And our counts should be something like this. Zero, two, three, two, one, 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 three, one, two. 
And once again, from these counts, we've got to compute the prefix sum so that we've got indices into the output array rather than just counts themselves. And our prefix sum should look something like this. And then once again, we've got to rebuild our output array from these prefix sums. You move all the way backwards through your input array, building your output array as you go. And when you look at the final result, what you'll notice is that the list of data is sorted. Good stuff. So we performed three iterations through our little list just there using counting sort, computing a little prefix sum, rebuilding our output and then swapping the input and output data. And we've got a sorted list of data. And that my friends is pretty much how the radix sort works with uh, a counting sort. So you can imagine if there was more digits, you would just repeat the same steps. So the important thing about the radix sort is that it examines digits at a time. And if you look at just a single digit, say in, in base 10, then there's more information in that single digit than just greater than or less than. Looking at a single digit in base 10 splits the data into 10. And that's really where radix sorts get their speed from. Okay, so the conclusion. Um, radix sorts require a lot of RAM compared to something like a quick sort. So we'll have a look at the code for radix sorts and quick sort in the next video. But if the size of the data that we're sorting is large enough, maybe a thousand elements or 10,000 elements, uh, you will find that the radix sort starts to perform very, very well, despite the overheads of having to allocate extra RAM. Radix sorts are not useful all the time. So especially if you have small lists of something like 10 or 100 elements, then just allocating the output array, allocating the count uh, array, um, you're already going to take longer than something like a quick sort may, might take to sort the entire list. So for small lists, uh, radix sort is not going to be the way to go. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that uh, radix sort works naturally with unsigned integers. It works naturally with numbers. I mean, it's 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 really dealing with the digits of numbers. So if your data is not uh, just unsigned integers, then you will find that you've uh, you've often got to change it a little bit or. Um, custom build your radix sort to deal with that. So for instance, if you wanted to radix sort floating point numbers, um, you've actually got to switch the sign so that they're all positive. And then at the end, perform one more iteration of radix sort, just considering the original signs of the numbers. If you want to uh, radix sort signed integers, then you actually have to add some offset to all of them. Yeah, but it can be done. The traditional radix sort or the basic radix sort really only deals with uh, unsigned uh, integer data. And uh, that's about all that I wanted to say for the moment. So thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a really good day. Adios. Yeah, you just can't allocate all of the RAM in the world for your counting sort. I mean, maybe you can. I don't know. I can't. Whatever to do, etc. But let's just move on.